So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this panel, which is for Israeli society between rhetoric and reality. Well, each of our fantastic panelists today have focused on very different dimensions and eras of Israeli society, ranging from anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox halakhic theory to labor Zionist women in the pre-state period, to contemporary Druze women navigating gendered spaces, to the famed thinker Hannah Arendt, to Indian Jews who migrated to Israel from Southeast Asia, each of them have focused on the incongruity between expectations about Israeli society and the reality of life in Israel. Frequently, our expectations, our arguments, and our assumptions about Israeli society don't match the change, the inconsistency, and the malleability that shape people's lived experiences there. Our presenters today will highlight these unexpected moments in which their rigorous scholarly research illuminates this change, this adaptation, and these surprises, which challenge the idea that Israeli society is a monolithic and homogenous whole. These studies are of a tremendous benefit to us as they show us that Israeli society is not one fixed and unchanging thing, but a multifaceted and negotiable network, right, with opportunities to push forward on new frontiers of study. So I want to make sure that we have as much time as possible for our scholars and for the Q&A panel. So I'm going to hand it off really quickly to our first pre presenter. Uh, as we make our way through the presentations, please write down any questions that you might have. Uh, you can post these questions in the chat at the end of our presentations, or you can use the raise hand function under reactions, and I'll call on you and you can ask it directly. So without further ado, our first presenter is Aviv Asayag, whose presentation, The Ultra-Orthodox Case Against Zionism, Probing, probing at the, legal, the Jewish Legal Viewpoint. Um, Aviv is a Los Angeles area based undergraduate at UCLA, where he majors in political science and has conducted several law-related research projects. Headed into his senior year, Aviv plans to attend law school after completing his undergraduate studies. Take it away, Aviv. Hello, everybody. Let me... Okay. Um, so, as Avery just alluded to with that wonderful introduction, um, I'm Aviva Sayag, and in a nutshell, um, throwing fancy titles aside, my paper just looked at kind of the... Jewish religious law reasons for why ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists think and believe what they do. Um, and then as a bit of a spoiler alert, I basically went on to, you know, explore the fundamental premise behind that, um, kind of give some counter rebuttals, and I think um, ultimately poke some decent holes in, in their theory. Um, so first, so that things don't get too confusing, a bit of background on some basic but key terms when discussing Zionists. And this is all within the ultra-Orthodox movement. So non-Zionists are actually the, major, uh, the majority within ultra-Orthodox um, Jews. Uh, and the reason that they're non-Zionists, uh, obviously they're kind of, as the name implies, non-aligned. Um, but especially after the aftermath, they recognize that Jewish people need somewhere to go. Um, also, they recognize that being ultra-Orthodox Jews and being very visibly Jewish, they probably are treated better in, in a, a secular Israel than they would be in a Christian or Muslim nation. I mean, also, this is a point of contention in Israeli society, but they benefit from um, subsidies from the Israeli government. So anti-Zionists um, is what this paper talks about for the most part. And within the ultra-Orthodox movement, um, they are now a vocal minority. Um, and so they actively oppose and protest the state of Israel um, and its right to exist, at least right now. And then Zionists are also a vocal minority. Um, Rabbi Cook is one of the movement's founding fathers. And um, there's a strong sense of nationalism um, within a lot of the ultra-Orthodox Zionists. Um, so whenever you talk about religiously based Zionism, I think it's important to touch on Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, who's probably the most influential modern ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists. Um, and then he also has a, a book, which I'll show in the next slide, um, called Vayol Moshe, which is really a, kind of a staple amongst the ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists. Um, and then I think it's also important to make a quick distinction, which is just that um, nowadays on social media or on any media in general, uh, m when people think of anti-Zionism, it's usually from people that have problems with the state of Israel for religious, uh, sorry, for political reasons, 
um, or some other reasons, and, and these are mostly non-Jews that are criticizing the state of Israel. So, so what I'm discussing here is something much different. Um, and so, as the last bullet point kind of alludes to, my research is really looking into the Jewish religious law, uh, or halakha, explanations um, for anti-Zionists. So, as I mentioned, um, on the left is Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, really important to the movement. And then on the right is his influential book, um, at least influential among ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists. So the, the biggest takeaway from all of my research basically is that if you had to center um, from a halakhic standpoint what ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists pin their religious argument on, it's really the three oaths. Um, and I'll go into it in the next couple of slides, but basically the three oaths, they're, they're a dialogue between Talmudic rabbis. So Rabbi Zera, Rabbi Yehuda, the premise is basically that Rabbi Zera wanted to live in the land of Israel. Rabbi Yehuda um, didn't want to move to the land of Israel, thought that Jews shouldn't immigrate before the Messiah's arrival. Um, as I'm sure most people know, the vast majority of Jews think that the Messiah has not arrived yet and are uh, awaiting um, the Messiah's arrival. And then the three oaths are found in the Talmud in Ketubot 111 and uh, A, and it kind of um, it kind of dissects three portion of the Tanakh. Um, so Song of Solomon uh, 27, 3, 5, which is actually identical to 27, and then 8, 4. Um, and then interestingly, as you'll see when you actually see the text, the first two oaths um, are kind of binding the Jewish people, and then the third oath, if the first two oaths are heeded by the Jewish people, kind of binds God in a way. So the first oath, this is just the translated um, English version. The first oath is that Jews should not ascend to Eretz Israel as a wall, um, but little by little, we'll go over the term in a second. The second oath is that God basically adjured the Jews that they shouldn't go against the world order. And then the third oath is that um, God promises not to subjugate the Jews to excessive punishment if the first two oaths are met. So, let's see, okay. So the first oath, um, I think at least, is probably the most important of the three because it lays the groundwork for the other two. And basically it says that um, Jews that want to make Aliyah to the land of Israel um, and want to live there should do so gradually, not in a wall. And not in a wall is just kind of fancy archaic terminology for coming in mass in huge groups. Um, and so a lot of anti-Zionists, especially radical contingents like Neturei Karta, um, interpret this oath with kind of a hardline approach. Um, and so as I mentioned over here, there, there's a bit of discourse between anti-Zionists, but um, some anti-Zionists take this point to mean that all Zionist-driven immigration to the land of Israel is wrong because of the first oath. And so then the second oath um, basically says that the Jews shouldn't resist the world order. And so present day Zion, anti-Zionists look to this um, and among other things, they say, well, um, there's broad international condemnation towards Israel's alleged, uh, alleged occupation over Palestinian territories. And there's over 30 UN member states that don't recognize Israel. And so because of those reasons and others, um, most of the Jews worldwide, especially those that are living in Israel, are in violation of the second oath. They're contributing towards something that's uh, against the world order. And here's a, a picture of um, some ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists at a protest. And then the third oath um, binds on God, pretty self-explanatory, Basically, that if the Jewish people were to heed the first two oaths, um, that God would not subjugate them too excessively. Um, and so anti-Zionists look at the atrocities that Jewish people have had to endure. Rabbi Teitelbaum actually references the Holocaust in particular, and basically says that because you, the Jewish people, did not hold your end of the deal with the first two oaths, well, that's kind of why you're suffering or have been suffering historically. So my, the remainder of my paper kind of looked at, you know, what's wrong with that framework? Um, and so in response to uh, the second oath, which touches against going against the world order, um, you can bring up the fact that the League of Nations was an original supporter of Zionism. 
um, that the UN itself passed a resolution supporting the Jewish state in 1947, and that far more UN member states recognize Israel than don't. Um, but then the, the bulk of my paper was really kind of about um, fighting fire with fire, if you will, and, and coming from the same perspective that um, ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists come from, which is a religious one. So there's a letter from Rabbi Mir Simcha basically saying that um, Jews wouldn't be taking the land by force if they'd make Aliyah because of the Balfour Declaration. Um, and then there are some scholars that have noted that uh, the three oaths don't deserve the importance that they're given, that they're really all not that they're really uh, not all that important to Judaism. Um, other scholars have talked about that the three oaths might not even be halacha in the first place. They might not even be religious law um, and might instead be agada. And if that's the case, then there's really no kind of binding pretext on the Jewish people. And then there's actual Talmudic text that I found in Yoma 9b, which um, is really in stark contrast to the three oaths, and it criticizes the Jewish people for not embarking on Aliyah soon enough. Um, and there's also Rabbi Zira. Um, this is kind of interesting. He is the author of the three oaths. Um, he himself moved to the land of Israel. In his later years, he actually reneged on the three oaths, and then stated that he favored the contradicting opinion in Yoma, which is more of a, a Zionist argument. Um, and then there's also rabbis that point out, essentially, that there's tons of respected halakhic authorities that don't cite the three oaths, so Rif, Rambam, Ramban, the Rosh, all don't make mention of the three oaths, as far as I could research in their work. And then um, on top of that, there's even more Talmudic text, um, actually very closely situated to the three oaths itself in Ketubot 110b, um, which permits one to compel their family and their household um, to immigrate to the land of Israel. Um, so it, it allows them to um, compel somebody, and then it states that once they're in Jerusalem, um, no one may remove them from there. So that's kind of another um, piece of text that goes contrary um, to the three oaths. There were a number of others that I made in my um, paper, but for uh, time purposes and for highlighting the most important ones, those are basically it. Um, and so in conclusion, the three oaths is kind of the basis for why ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists think the way they do. So I mentioned a bunch of rebuttals um, and I think that those rebuttals poke some serious holes into kind of the anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox underpinning um, and calls into question a bit their authority. And that's it. Thanks so much. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Aviv. That was awesome. Um, let's move on to our second presenter. So our second presenter is Jonah Kaufman Cohen, whose presentation is Expectations and Experience of Women in the Labor Zionist Movement. Jonah just graduated from American University with a BA in history, Mazalto, and he lives in Washington, D.C., where he's about to begin work at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Take it away, Jonah. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. So, hello, everyone. I'm Jonah Coppin Cohen, and I'll be presenting on my paper. They want not only to hand over the bricks, but also to lay them in place themselves. Expectations and experience of women in the labor Zionist movement. So, my paper looks at two main thrusts. The first is the literature that sort of established the expectations of prospective labor Zionists who are considering making Aliyah to the land of Israel in the 1930s to see what sort of the propaganda model was for what they were to expect when it came to gender equality. And then the experiences of the women themselves who went over to the land of Israel to join the Labor Zionist project. So my thesis was, despite the movement's radical egalitarian rhetoric, women in the Labor Zionist movement were often held to higher work standards than their male comrades and had to fight for their right to be included in all types of labor and to be taken seriously in their own right. So first, let me give you some historical background and context on the Labor Zionist movement. So Labor Zionism was the leading form of Zionism until the 1970s. 
they were Israel's ruling electoral party, pretty much uncontested until 1977. And according to the ideology of labor Zionism, it recognizes Israel as the ancient homeland of the Jews, but it also seeks to build a modern Jewish state as a workers utopia. So along socialist lines as proposed by thinkers like Karl Marx in the 1800s. And labor Zionism prioritized this idea of a return to the land. They had this ideological idea that the Jews in the diaspora had sort of become weak because they had been deprived of their ancestral and historical connection to the land. And, you know, anti-Semitic laws in the diaspora had, present, had prevented Jews from ownership of the land, had prevented them from working as farmers. And so labor Zionists saw the creation of a state of Israel as a way to recreate a sort of ancestral right to work the land and in this way create what they called either the new Jew or the muscle Jew, which was sort of this idea that was opposed to their concept of the diaspora Jew as weak. It sort of saw the Jew in the land as a strong worker. And therefore the labor Zionist movement prioritized this idea of pioneering in which especially young people would come from the diaspora, make Aliyah to the state, to the land of Israel, and then work on kibbutzim, which were these communes that were set up to make agricultural produce and to essentially strengthen the character of the Jewish people. And with this modernist embrace of socialist ideas came a rejection of traditional life. This included a rejection of the traditional family and most importantly for my paper, a rejection, at least on paper, to the patriarchy and the traditional subjugation of women. So first, let's look at some of the ways that the labor Zionist movement communicated its expectations of this gender utopia to its prospective adherents. So for my paper, I looked at several movement publications that were produced in the 1920s and 30s that were meant sort of as both as propaganda and sort of guidebooks, a sort of what should an aspiring pioneer expect to find in the land of Israel when they get there. So one of these was the Jewish communal settlements in Palestine, which sort of claimed, as it turns out misleadingly, that women were found in all fields of labor in the kibbutzim. One of the interesting texts I looked at was called the Kfutza, and it took a more nuanced approach to what women could expect once they arrived in the land of Israel. So it acknowledged that there are perennial social problems that Zionism and labor Zionism were having trouble getting to the root of. So this would mean essentially blaming women for their social heritage of passivity that was learned in the diaspora, essentially saying that the labor Zionist movement hasn't had time to fix centuries of internalized oppression. But on the other hand, it offers that women are not con contained to routine female occupations. And there is at least the idea of complete equality between women and men. However, it's also a bit backhanded in its praise for women, saying that a certain number of exceptional women are able to work in the fields, implying that women are still by nature inferior, and it takes an exceptional woman to do the work of a normal man. Another interesting source I looked at in terms of expectations was The Land of Promise, which was the first film that was produced in the land of Israel by the Zionist authorities. And it stated that the women pioneers of Palestine demand and obtain an equal share of the hardest work on the land. They are plowwomen, stonebreakers, road workers, and in the cities, they are masons, bricklayers, and builders. So taken together, these movement publications and propaganda films are meant to suggest that if a labor Zionist woman makes Aliyah and goes to Palestine and works on the kibbutzim, then she will find herself in equal to men in all ways. But this contrasts strongly with what I found when I looked at the primary sources that chronicle the experiences of women in the land. So I looked at several case studies. The most famous woman I looked at was Golda Meir, who would go on to become Israel's first prime minister. Golda Meir and her husband made Aliyah to the land of Israel in the 1930s from the United States. And Golda Meir reported in her firsthand account of her arrival on Kibbutz Mojavia that efforts at work did not make as great an impression on the young men as the phonograph and records. So essentially, Golda Meir on Kibbutz was not valued for her ability as a worker, but was valued for her ability 
to bring material gains, especially as an American who was richer than the European immigrants, to the kibbutz, which I found fairly ironic given the socialist ideology of the labor Zionist movement that Instead of seeing Golda Meir as a worker, they see her only as a purveyor of consumer culture. Another example of a woman I looked at was Batia Brenner. Batia Brenner made Aliyah from, Pal from Poland in the 1930s. I found her story a bit heartbreaking. She had come with these ideas that she would find equality in the land of Israel, a land where everyone works like everyone else, but found that her dreams were crushed by the reality that even her fellow women would scold her that you're not a girl at all, you don't even know how to sweep. And there was much laughter and yet in the end they had to take me because there was no one else. So essentially she would only be allowed to work in the fields if no one else could be found for the job. She was disparaged by both her male and female comrades. Her female comrades claimed that she was lacking in femininity because she wanted to work with the men and the men thought of her as lesser than they were, and she was forced to work double duty, both in the fields and in the kitchens, until her hands bled and she was forced to leave the kibbutz defeated. Tahia Lieberson was an example of a woman who worked on an urban kibbutz, which was different from Batia Brenner's experience on a farming kibbutz, but she found a similar level of discrimination against her. That there was sort of the systematic refused to allow women into the building trades because it was thought that it would decrease the amount that the male workers would be paid, which again is a little ironic given the ideal of a socialist utopia. And she was subjected to, page, to the patronizing comments of her male counterparts. But fortunately, Tihia Lieberson was able to sort of put in twice the amount of work to win the respect of her male comrades. Another woman I looked at was Rachel Yanat ben -Zvi, who sort of took a more philosophical approach to the question of women's equality within labor Zionism. She claimed that although women were as passionate in their support for the labor Zionist cause by clinging to the traditional roles that women had been assigned to in the house and the kitchen and denying them a role in the land, that the, the labor Zionist movement was denying women their chance to become new Jews and was continuing to deny them their connection to the land of Israel. So to move to my conclusion, the young men and women of the labor Zionist movement rejected all the values of traditional society, yet when it came time to put their ideas into action, the traditional values they had been raised with were evident in their behaviors. Long-standing beliefs like those concerning the role of women are hard to wipe away even when it comes to the most committed revolutionaries. So the conclusions of my paper are important not only for understanding the rise of labor Zionism and the creation of the state of Israel, but also when it comes to looking at any utopian movement in general, that you know the 1800s and 1900s were an era of utopian and modernist movements that sought to upend the way the world worked and sought to take on centuries old systems of oppression. And yet, as we see here with my study of the labor Zionist movement, it's not enough to simply claim that you're working towards these goals, that all too often long-standing traditional values are going to be more powerful than one, two, or even three generations of people committed to breaking them down. And so with that in mind, we have to be critical of the promises made by utopian movements wherever they crop up. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Jonah. Such a rich primary sources in your work, it's so, I love primary source work. I'm a historian. I can't hide it. <laughs> and I won't try, but I love it when you just, you find these quotes that totally poke holes in the ideology. Is there a better example than Golda coming from Milwaukee with her phonographs and her records? And that's really what the kibbutz movement wants, even though they're rhetorically anti-capitalist. Uh, moving on then, our third presenter is Miles Luce, whose presentation is Druze Women and Gender in Israel, Literature Review and Future Trajectories. Miles is an incoming second year student at the University of Kansas Honors College, where they study women, gender, and sexuality studies, as well as art history. Their research, which is mentored by Dr. Rami Zidan, focuses on the sociological, political, and economic realities of how gender manifests itself in Druze society. They have received the Danziger Research Scholarship from KU's Jewish Studies Program and an undergraduate research award from the Honors College for their current research. In spring 2021, Miles was published by Zenith, 
undergraduate research journal and produced TEDx, uh, TEDx KU's event, Momentum. After graduating, Miles hopes to pursue a career in the museum world. Take it away, Miles. Thank you so much. And I would just like to say, um, coming from Kansas, it's it's really nice to be set part of such an international conversation. So, and can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Let's see, okay, awesome. So my presentation is about um, a fundamental concept in the current literature on Drew's women and gender in Drew society, which is about the relation between gender and spatial regulation. So I'll get right into it. And if you're unfamiliar with the Druze, they're a religious minority in Israel. And they're also located in other countries like um, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. And it was initially an offshoot of Islam, which was founded by Al-Hakim B. Amar Allah in 1017, um, who is a, a Fatimid caliph. And eventually the religion closed in 1043, which means to, even to this day, one is only Druze if they are born to a Druze mother and father. And so, but the fundamental question of gender in relation to this is thinking about gender as a more complex category of analysis. That's not just a conception of whether or not one is a man or a woman, but rather gender is something that is attached to economics, politics, religion, and in this case, material, material reality in space and how, how we move through the world and how that kind of anticipates our behaviors. Um, and so the intent here is to create a cross-disciplinary dialogue between sociology, anthropology, and gender studies in such a way that allows a more nuanced theorizations of gender for both fields. So the, the primary question of this research is, is what is, the, what is the state of the research currently on Druze women, gender, and Druze society? And this is necessary because there's not a comprehensive literature review um, from, from, from this feminist perspective. And by comprehensive, I mean both in the sense of a con in country and both in the sense of topic. So one that spans um, the transnational Druze context and one that is also includes um, kind of the comprehensive topics that our systematic literature, literature review talks about, which is gender and feminism, marriage and family, um, economics, um, health, and, and much more. But today I'll be talking about a subsection of that project, which is specifically located in Israel. And so even though the Druze are only 1% of the population and, and only live in 16 villages in Israel, they have the, the question of, of the Druze in research on Israel is quite important because of a concept that scholars of the Druze and Druze scholars called Druze particularism, which is the fashioning of a distinct Druze subjectivity by the Israeli government. So, and that entails kind of mandatory conscription for Druze men into the Israeli Defense Force, a separate schooling system, um, and et cetera, which is part of an Israeli project of state making. Um, and also, for more quantitative reasons within the systematic literature review, as you can see through this graph that I've included on out of the, the pool of data or of, of publications on the topic, you can see that Israel, which is the blue color, dominates um, the, the, the publications on, on the question of Druze women and gender and Druze society, which will allow us as researchers to kind of have the most um, specific and nuanced view of gender in this context. Um, and so, first, I want to, but I want to go more into systematic, into the methodology here that's at hand. So, which is known as a meta ethnography, and so a meta ethnography seeks to create third order concepts. If you want to think of first order concepts as uh, the literal data, so um, interviews from participants, questionnaires, uh, st statistics, etc., and then second order constructs as the findings by articles. Third order concepts are. Um, thematic analyses of entire bodies of literature that allow us to see kind of what's going on as in a more comprehensive and whole way. Um, and so that entailed uh, searching databases for articles, turning them into annotated bibliographies, and then sectionalizing those and extracting certain data for, from those, whether it be quantitative or qualitative. And then now at this point, which I'm going to share with you, is kind of more of this discussion and conclusion and viewing how what gender means in this context. So I'm, first, I want to talk about the question of gendered space in terms of mobility. So in Drew society, there is a there is a um, a prevalent sense of sexual honor that women possess that should not be transgressed and requires their protection by men. Um, and so this is this is specifically legislated by all male 
um, bodies, uh, or legislative bodies, like the religious council, who by the Israeli government are designated as state officials according to uh, cultural autonomy laws, which practically green lights, you know, the legislation of women's bodies where they can and cannot go. Um, because there are, um, to protect this notion of sexual honor, women are, per, are um, not allowed to leave their villages without um, a male chaperone known as a mahram. And so in this sense, um, it is not just it is not just a, uh, like a state body that is that is regulating women. It is also certain community attitudes, which this article, Dion 2019, does a very interesting job of going into. It explains that what sexual honor is a is a prevalent notion in the Jewish community. However, it's not one that's totalizing. To argue that it would be totalizing would probably be culturalist, but it still controls. It controls. Um, uh, how how women it controls and anticipates women's behavior as I will demonstrate and also allows in exhibits a fundamental double standard because men are engaging in uh, activities that would be considered sexually dishonorable but obviously aren't legislated for that because it's not it's not entrenched in their conceptions of of, of their gender. Um, and so an enforcing mechanism of this regime of, of spatial gender um, is, is gossip, which might seem trivial if we think about it like gossiping with our friends in high school or college. But considering the, sm the very small um, nature of Drew's villages, it, it, is, it is a mechanism that really controls people's behavior in that it, it, it controls their reputation and it, and it kind of it controls their social standing in their entire social life because almost in their the entirety of their social life is confined to the to the village itself so um um we can see that in uh certain uh contexts like for example women uh we can see that um uh for example one woman a widow um she uh did not drive to work without a chaperone um you know to avoid that kind of gossip and it it, it also exhibits the degree to which gender controls because Considering she was a widow, her son, who was only, I think, 17 or 18 years old, still had that ability to chaperone her, even though she was ages older than him, um, which which really speaks to the, the prevalence of this kind of form of regulation. Um, also, and if we want to think about space in different kinds of ways, Drew's women, um, this the, the rules against them leaving the village also applied to them pursuing higher education. So the first Drew's women started pursuing higher education in the 1980s, um, and um, now they're kind of forced to, um, because they cannot sleep outside of the village, they're forced to commute. In between them and so there is one testimony that a, a Druze woman gives where she kind of exhibits a profound sense of anxiety where she's like if I when, when I'm at the bus station is someone going to see me am it someone going to see me someone else is are people going to talk and it really reflects the the concept that the, the authors of that article Blumen and Zafrir um, talk about which is the spatialization of everyday life and how kind of space controls and anticipates certain um anticipates Drew's women's behavior. And so in this sense, we can think about gender as not something that's just state discipline, not something that is just community control, but also kind of an, uh, an affective mechanism of governance, one that governs the very psychology of, of women in this, site, in this society. Um, and so considering that we've, we've talked about how gendered space operates in this context, we might also talk about how one um, can resist gendered space uh, through, or, or what agents, what, what does it mean uh, to enact a, like agential um, resistances in this case? And so what agency just means is like the capability to act or in this context, it might be the capability to resist or subvert gendered space. So um, in, throughout the literature, there are two um, explicit concepts, more explicit concepts that I'd like to share that might give us a little um, uh, glimpse into how Drew's women resist these kinds of formulations of gendered space. The first is concealment, which I which I write that you might think about as evading the gaze of power, because uh, um, it there is not a world in which really the the gendered space can be deconstructed. Rather, the purpose of this project is to see how it can be subverted, or the very the real kind of subversions that Drew's women do, rather than as a researcher postulating, oh, we should deconstruct it in this way. The purpose here is documentation, not postulation. So, 
um, in this article, um, Barakat, she um, talks about how, consider, like I mentioned earlier, um, widows are, are, you know, surveilled in, in that, in the gendered sense. She talks about how their agent, how they engage in a certain agency in regards to their sexuality um, through both cyber spaces and both lying to their chaperones, which allows them a greater sense of uh, sexual autonomy in a way that subverts, you know, uh, the, the, the sexual and gendered uh, regulations of their body. Um, and then another concept is one of negotiation, which I think you can, uh, which you, one can think of it as moving within power or kind of like bargaining with power. Um, in an article by Weiner Levy, uh, she talks about how Drew's fathers um, um, negotiate um, and use their, their privilege in order and, and face risks of excommunication from the Jerusalem religion to send their daughters uh, to higher educational institutions. And it also details the kinds of negotiations that daughters make within their families to attend higher education. And this concept of negotiation is very prevalent throughout the literature. And it's also um, prevalent in cinematic representations of the Druze, like in The Syrian Bride, where um, the protagonist, who's a Druze woman who lives in the Golan Heights, um, she's marrying a Syrian Druze man, and considering the geopolitical situation, it's very complicated to move for her to move to Syria. And so the negotiations she makes in, in the last scenes of the movie aren't just this kind of abstract negotiation with gender, but are literal negotiations, bargainings, or gestures with between guard posts and at a checkpoint. And so, and, and that is really kind of the core of this theorization of gender. That gender is not just something that is abstract, but is quite literally material, anticipates how we move within the world and controls where we can move. Um, and so, I'd like to say that that's the kind of nuanced third order concepts we can get from a systematic literature review, which has us look at the entirety of a literature base rather than reading um, a couple of articles without, you know, a, a grand, grander sense of the literature and where the literature is going. And a systematic literature review also allows us to see kind of what where holes are in the in in uh, the current research. For example, future trajectories might represent viewing this kinds of concepts of gender in Lebanese, Syrian, and Jordanian contexts, and also might think about, well, what does gender mean for Druze men in this context, especially because the forms of um, subjectification um, that Druze men undergo in secondary schooling is, is very much a gendered process and very much a process about creating a certain kind of military masculinity that allows them to, allows a smooth conscription of them into the military. Um, and also their conceptions of fatherhood, which some have written about, but not to a very great extent. So yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Um, and yeah. Great, thank you so much, Miles. I also have to say for an incoming second year, and that's what you are, to say remarkably mature methodology. It's very impressive. And you're, uh, you're filling in a really understudied segment of Israeli sociology. Drew's Women is very much kind of the myth of kind of being a progressive nation, look at all this upward mobility that's possible, but it's not studied the way that you guys are studying it now, which is with scholarly tools. So I very much look forward to what is coming next and to learning more about the actual data that we can extract from that. Uh, our fourth presenter is going to be Edward Mualim, whose presentation is a description of a struggle, Hannah Arendt on Zionism. Ada graduated from UC San Diego, Mazalto, this spring, majoring in biology and minoring in Hebrew language and literature. He plans to attend law school and hopes to pursue a career at the intersection of policy, biology, and political philosophy. Take it away, Eddie. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. Is it possible just thumbs up, Avery, if it's good? Perfect. Uh, so yeah, today I'll be talking about Hannah Arendt and Zionism. Hannah Arendt was, of course, one of the most important political philosophers of the 20th century. Her introduction to Zionism came with uh, Hitler and the burning of the Reichstag in uh, 1933. It was that moment that uh, it, it gave her the sense of the important existential question of the Jewish people. And she felt that indifference was no longer possible, uh, leading to her to one of her few moments of concrete political action, uh, wherein she linked up with Kurt Blumenfeld, her good friend and president of the Zionist organization, uh, Federation of Germany. And he, she was tasked with compiling a, a list of anti-Semitic statements to show the pervasive nature of anti-Semitism uh, in Germany at the time. And while doing so, she raised the attention, the suspicions of a librarian 
uh, who reported her to the SA and she was arrested and charged with the promotion of horror propaganda. And uh, it, it, miraculously, uh, just eight days later, she managed to escape. Uh, and after that, she uh, fled Germany, traveling through Prague and Geneva, landing eventually in Paris, uh, where she took a job with Youth Alia, working then with the Zionist Federation of Germany to resettle Jewish children fleeing Nazi Germany and Palestine. And so this is a picture of her in 1935, when she accompanied one of those groups of children from France, staying several weeks uh, with her good friends Hans Jonas in uh, Jerusalem. For Arendt, uh, Zionism was the first and only sphere of Jewish political action. It was in her mind an antidote to what she saw as a defining uh, Jewish passivity. Uh, and I think this quote from Origins of Totalitarianism uh, summarizes that well. She writes, Jewish history offers the extraordinary spectacle of a people unique in this respect, which began its history with a well-defined concept of history and an almost conscious resolution to achieve a well-circumscribed plan on earth. And then without giving up this concept, avoided all political action for 2000 years. It may be worth though, calling into question Arendt's knowledge of Jewish history. Hans Jonas, her good friend uh, would do so after her death, remarking that for her, the history of Jews only began towards the end of the 18th century. Uh, this is Hans Jonas here on the right. And it also goes against many of her most profound influences. Uh, take for example, Bernard Lazier here on the left, a socialist and Zionist uh, who would remark that uh, revolution was actually the essence of the Hebrew spirit and Jews in uh, secret societies constitute the fighting force of the French revolution. And this was in a twisted way echoed uh, by many notable anti-Semites like Hitler or Nazi theorist Alfred Rosenberg, who would uh, be obsessed and, and compulsive about Jewish Bolshevism and uh, Jewish revolution. So uh, this was Hannah Arendt's introduction to Zionism. In 1941, she escaped Vichy, France, getting a visa to the US, wherein she would start beginning to publish her, her, her writings in the German Jewish newspaper Aufbau and the Menorah Journal and Commentary Magazine, among others. And given the seriousness and her experience with the Holocaust, she began publishing her calls for Jewish self-defense at the time. And this quote here is from a piece called uh, The Jewish Army, The Beginning of Jewish Politics, wherein she derides the Jewish nation as an old man who uh, dedicates himself to survival uh, through the avoidance of all activity. And here she develops one of the central theses of her work. You can only defend yourself as the person you are attacked as. Essentially, she fundamentally wants Jews to command status as Jews. Of course, Arendt was not alone in uh, calling for a Jewish army. She found herself in the unlikely company of revisionist leaders like Arya Ben Eliezer and most prominently uh, Vladimir Jabotinsky. But Arendt knew these men and their organization, Yagun, as manifestations of Jewish fascism. And she would assert that they were simply trying to gain influence through terrorist methodologies. Uh, yeah, such as, you know, for example, the bombing of the Patria here shown on the left, wherein the Agana uh, bombed a ship carrying 1800 Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany uh, as it was coming in uh, to, to Palestine, a British ship. And uh, I think what Arendt notes about the Agana and the Irgun that's specifically interesting is that they had a coalescence far more effective than what could have been motivated by fear or motivated by the Nazis and the Holocaust. It was uh, this that uh, motivated her to start looking into uh, uh, the, Zionist, the Zionism and the movement of Zionism. And in 1942, she was nothing short of a labor Zionist. Uh, she would write in the Jewish war that isn't happening. The right of the Jewish people in Palestine is the same right every human being has the fruits of his work. That the Arabs had 1500 years to turn a stony desert into a fertile land, whereas the Jews have had not even 40. And that difference is quite remarkable. It's this belief in the transformation of pre previously unproductive land that, that defines Arendt's uh, understanding of Zionism, not as imperialism or colonialism, but something extraordinarily different from anything that happened in the past. In her view, there were simply no riches in Palestine to exploit. And this is one of the few points of consistency she would maintain even after 1948. One of the issues though that Arendt would see very clearly, unlike these revisionist Zionists, was the Arab-Jewish conflict. She would write that in focusing their attention so heavily on the British, both Arabs and Jews practically ignored each other. 
And this was exacerbated by the wider watertight walls of economic separation uh, that was artificially imposed in Palestine. Arab labor was seen as a dangerous uh, threat to the Jewish workforce because they were less rice, rights conscious and, uh, and were cheaper, providing constant temptation for Jewish capital in Palestine. And in this way, uh, Jewish class struggle was always at its heart a fight against the employment of Arab workers. Uh, this picture on the left shows uh, one such protest, the campaign for Hebrew work in an orchard. And uh, this campaign basically led to a labor capital pact that effectively ensured the exclusion of the Arab workforce. And it was this political distinction uh, that Arendt noted, it effectively prevented the Jewish elite from falling into a more traditional mode of um, colonialism characterized by the exploitation of native labor. Uh, her understanding of the Arab Jewish conflict allowed her to make a number of prescient assumptions uh, as to the future of the state. She would write that even after, uh, if the Jews managed to win the war of independence, which she thought was highly unlikely, uh, it would provide no long-term security for the Jewish people. She predicted that the Jewish state would be surrounded by uh, an ever hostile Arab population in threatened borders and would be so absorbed with physical self-defense that it would submerge all culture and interests and activities. And this is what led her to the formation of her pithy remark that a Jewish state can only be erected at the price of a Jewish homeland. At the time in 1942, uh, Judah Leon Magnus had proposed his uh, proposal for a binational state within an Arab federation, and it was gaining much support behind uh, several notable Zionists like Henrietta Solb, uh, intellectuals like Martin Buber. But in Arendt's mind, this proposal placed far too much confidence in state structures and their ability to guarantee minority rights. Given her experience in the Holocaust, she was very suspicious of sovereign states and didn't believe in inalienable rights at all. Instead, Arendt proposed uh, a Jewish state that could be incorporated into a federation, which she alternatively suggests could be the British Commonwealth or a Mediterranean federation that would include many Arab countries, but not be Arab dominant. Uh, in 1944, Arendt published her most uh, surprising reversal of her public views entitled Zionism Reconsidered. Here, she asserts that Zionism uh, has outlived its political conditions and it was once a, a very genuine movement, but now is nothing more than a living ghost. But considering that it's uh, 1944 once again, and almost a million Jews have been deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau in the preceding five months before the publication of this piece, it's really hard to see how um, Arendt could say that Zionism had at this point outlived its political conditions. But one distinction she puts forth is that she feels strongly that any future Jewish state would only be a home for Jews, an asylum for Jews from certain diaspora countries. And her prediction here was in many ways rendered true. Uh, after the war, Ben-Gurion chose to uh, focus immigration efforts on Bulgarian and Romanian Jews, uh, noting that they had suffered less than uh, those in displaced person camps and uh, that they would need far less emotional and uh, physical rehabilitation. And he also felt that the DP camps would uh, serve as a form of passive political pressure on the international community uh, to work in favor of a Jewish state. Uh, Arendt would continue to indict the issue in a piece published in May 1948, uh, the month of uh, the independence war, to, uh, called To Save a Jewish Homeland. And in this essay, she would write that the establishment of any form of Jewish sovereignty in Palestine would only establish the sovereign right of the Jewish people to commit suicide. Uh, here, you know, on the foundation of that understanding, she provides increasingly preposterous solutions to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, she alternatively suggests a trusteeship uh, by the British government, a truce by sincere believers in negotiation, or the formation of mixed Arab and Jewish rural councils uh, as genuine and realistic political measures that can eventually lead to the political emancipation of Palestine. But while Arendt saw these uh, measures as realistic, it's hard to see how any form of cooperation or this level of cooperation could be achieved in what um, both Jews and Arabs felt was an all out war for survival. And it's also hard to understand how someone who so vociferously advocated for uh, a, a Jewish army and uh, a, a end to Jewish passivity now uh, so vociferously opposed 
a Jewish war for self-determination. Arendt's writings on Zionism undoubtedly are, are riddled with many, many contradictions. But it, what I would suggest is that, that these contradictions themselves are, are reason enough to read Arendt. Uh, in her writings, one sees someone who's incredibly brilliant acknowledging the complexities that have always uh, plagued the Jewish state. Her work paints the portrait of a uh, portrait of nuance, that the kind that is seldom uh, found in, in those who feel the incessant need to shelter Israel from criticism. And it's the nature of this one-sided thinking that she attacks herself and to save a Jewish homeland. She writes that unanimity of opinion is a very ominous phenomenon and one characteristic of our modern mass age. It destroys social and personal life, which is based on the fact that we are different by nature and by conviction. To hold different opinions and to be aware that other people think differently on the same issue shields us from that godlike certainty which stops all discussion and reduces social relationships to those of an antique. In her opinions on Zionism, Arendt certainly displayed little of this univocity she so detested. She was almost always in disagreement uh, with everyone, friends, notable Zionists, and occasionally even herself. And this internal contradiction would be ever present. In 1969, in a letter to her best friend, Mary McCarthy, she would share that still, after penning her most striking criticism of Israel, any real catastrophe in Israel would affect her more deeply than anything else. Till the end, Arendt embodied this incongruity, and it was precisely her honesty in these matters and her unwillingness to conform that, in my mind, makes her Zionism's essential pariah. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Eddie. You really, uh, I think you put your hand on what we can say is paradoxically the archetypal Arendtian position, which is it's inconsistent. She changes so rapidly year to year. That's what makes her so engaging to read. It's what makes her difficult to read. I think negatively, we can say that she's not a consistent thinker, but she's also modeling for us a more engaged way of philosophizing, a more engaged way of thinking about the world. And I want to move on to our fifth and final presenter, but certainly not the least. I have to note that he is joining us from India, which is extremely impressive, and it's almost midnight there. So big respect to him for this. And uh, this presenter is Molly Tiwari whose presentation is The Indian Jewish Diaspora in Israel. Molly Tawari is a first year student of the bachelor's degree in defense and strategic studies at Rashtrika Rasha University, RRU in India. His areas of interest include international diplomacy and India-Israel relations. Prior to this conference, he participated in the Model United Nations Conference co-internship in April, 2021, where he submitted a draft on Uyghur Muslims of China and a national level workshop on WTO and geoeconomics that was organized by Global Policy Insights in Delhi. His topic of presentation today is the Indian Jewish diaspora in Israel. Take it away, Molly. Thank you for such a good introduction. So good morning, everyone. I am glad to present. I am glad to attend my first international conference where I would like to present my work on Indian Jewish diaspora in Israel. After 70 CE, the three main Jewish communities of Israel migrated to India who were migrated to Israel as with the establishment as a nation in 1948. So basically there are three categories of Jews in Israel. The first is the Ashkenazi Jews who are from Western Europe, America, Greece and Turkey. The second is the Sephardi Jews who are from Spain, North Africa and Egypt. The third is the Mizrahi Jews who are from East Asia, Iraq, Yemen, and Egypt. And Indian Jews are considered as Mizrahi Jews. So let me first introduce you to the three main Jewish communities of India. The three main Jewish communities of India are the Cochin Jews, the Baghdadi Jews, and the Bene Israeli Jews who, mig who migrated to Israel with the establishment in 1948 to make Aliyah in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. India is among the few countries in the world where the Jews never experienced nationalist narratives of Jewish persecution by Hitler. As of 2019, there are 85,000 Indian Jews in Israel. This map shows where the Indian Jews were inhabited in India before they migrated to Israel after 1948. 
so the ba- so basically the common reason for migration of indian jews to israel was jewishness shelva well a recent, renowned scholar on indian jews mentions that indian jews were jewish by religion but essentially indian in their socio culture behavior it suggests that indian jewry was assimilated by religion but culturally distinct from mainstream jews of israel another sociologist mena singh chawla in a study of class ethnicity and language among indian jews mentions that there is significant heterogeneity among the three communities she also states that their south asian origin makes the indian jews a civilizational distinct within the mizrahi community thus the identity crisis was pronounced next i would like to talk about the indian jews of their identity as a migrant migrant communities often undergo a clash of identity and indian jews were no exception to this identity of indian jews was a mix of jewish israeli and indian the cochin jews were the first to arrive in india who were believed to be traders or refugees they held high political office under the local maharajas the bene israeli was the second jewish community to arrive in india who assimilated well with the hindu and jewish culture the baghdadi jews were the last to arrive in india who were identified more as europeans migrants who arrived under the law of britain enjoyed special privilege access to citizenship and benefits however this did not imply proper socio culture assimilation this forms the core of discussion in my paper now this map shows the migration trend of indian jews from india to israel after 1948 basically there were four cities where the indian where the indian jews were inhabited in india they were kolkata pune mumbai and kochi and from here they migrated to israeli cities like lod ramala kiryat gat and kiryat belak this picture shows the arrival of indian jews in israel after 1948 and this is another picture of indian jews from archives next i would like to talk about the impact of indo-israel ties on diaspora india formally recognized israel on 17 september 1950 and in 1953 israel was permitted to open a consulate in bombay in the late 1960s and 1970s indian jews made alia and immigrated to israel in large numbers and israeli prime minister golda meir once quoted about migrants that are we able to raise these migrants to a better level of civilization Now there are two schools of thought on the Indian Jewish diaspora living in Israel. According to researcher Selva Vale, before 1992, most of the Indian Jews were pro-Israel and pro-Jewish. So the Indian Jews never faced a clash of identity in Israel since they felt they were at home. During the period of informal ties, the Indian Jewish communities met and maintained an informal network. Lack of diplomatic ties did not impact them significantly. Another research Mena Singh says that thousands of Indian Jews were sent to remote development towns with migrants from North and West Asia. Mizrahis unlike the Ashkenazis were discriminated against because of their backward origins or dark skins. Indians fell under the same subset. In 1992 both the states established full diplomatic ties thus easing the connection between the Jewish diaspora and the Indian state. Many Indian Jews migrated to Israel but a small community stayed back. In 1951 there were 20,000 Bene Israel but by the 2006 there were no more than 5,000. The old woman in the picture is Sara Cohen, the oldest member of Kochi Jews community who passed away in 2019. The clash of values. The Indian Jews made aliyah for various reasons such as the search for better economic opportunities. Upon their arrival in their new homeland they faced initial discrimination within the socio culture space they had indian set of values while israel was highly influenced by european values due to dominant influence of ashkenazis in founding of israel for example before migration indian jews had family oriented approach and heavily discouraged divorce or separation like the hindu society the bene israeli was also polygamous the different wives of a man lived separately from each other and held different households with the encouragement of nuclear family planning by the israeli government the concept of individualism and interethnic marriages began to be considered by them after migrating to a newly formed state of israel 
Eventually, they were influenced by European values over a period of time, more prominently among second and third generation of Indian Jews. And at last, I would like to conclude my conclusion and main findings on Indian Jews. Indian Jewish identity can be labeled as a mix of Indianness in terms of culture, Jewish in terms of religion, and Israeli in terms of nationalism. Before 1992, in absence of diplomatic ties, Alia continued, but no special discrimination was directed against the Indian Jews. As Mizrahi Jews, social status of Indian Jews must be studied within the context of their identity as Eastern Jews who have been accorded a lower status in Israeli Jewish demographic landscape. And at last, what I can say that is the problem perhaps is that the individuals of different Jewish communities are not considered as people, but rather as tribe. Each tribe struggling for its own space where each tribe consider itself more important than the other. At last, I would like to thank you all for, attend for listening to my presentation. Now I am open to questions. Great, thank you so much, Molly. And uh, also just another fantastic presentation on you did such a great job. I was so impressed by this little like panel that we've put together. Uh, your work on Indian Jews, which I think you mentioned in your paper is actually the sixth biggest sub-ethnic group in Israeli society, which is putting it ahead Jews of Tunisia, Jews of Algeria and the like, but they are so understudied in a scholarly manner. And I think your work not only speaks to Israel studies but also to diaspora studies and to Sephardic studies. And so I'm really curious to know what we learn as we start to look to the Indian Jewish community in Israel as something really to study for historians, I think we're gonna learn a lot about how we can also expand the idea of Israeli society even more. And so we have about 17 minutes left for our Q&A session. I want you guys to start thinking about questions you wanna ask and you can either put them in the chat and I can read them or you can use the raise hand function and I can call out and you can uh, say your question to our panelists directly. While you guys are thinking about it, I'm going to take my uh, my ability as panel chair and exercise my privilege to ask the first question. And uh, I want to say our panel is broadly on Israeli society, but in reality, your presentations all focus on groups on the margins of Israeli society. So Aviv, in your work, this is the ultra-Orthodox who are often conjectured about, but still really poorly understood. Jonah, in your work, this is women in the labor Zionist movement, but more specifically, how their lived experiences differ from the idealized version of the kibbutz and the chalutzin. Miles, in your work, this is Jewish women, whose marginality is exemplified by the fact that your research really is one of just a handful of existing studies that examine Jews, both Jews women's role in Israeli society today. Edward, to be fair, by no measurement can we call an intellectual titan like Hannah Arendt understudied, <laughs> but you do cast her in a new and unexpected light. Her work on Nazism and totalitarianism, evil and otherwise are foundational, but her thoughts on Zionism and Jewish vitalism are less well known by the public. Um, and Molly, in your work, this is Indian Jews in Israel, who, as you've noted, despite being such a big sub-ethnic group in Israeli society, we know very little about for scholarship. And my question is for all of you, and so perhaps you can just answer in order that you presented. In light of these really fascinating but relatively undertapped studies that you've chosen to conclude, how did you all get interested in these topics? Yeah, thanks, Avery. That's a, a great question. I guess I'll go first since I um, presented first. Well, I, I give a lot of credit to um, the professor that helped me research the topic. Uh, Scott Abramson He's moderating one of the other. Um, he's moderating kind of one of the, the other panels. And I, I think I had a kind of a just inherent interest in um, religious anti-Zionism, because I think for somebody that is maybe unfamiliar with the region, um, the traditional thinking is, well, the more religious somebody is, the more likely they are to be extremists on being a nationalist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, it was, I, I had kind of thought about anti-Zionism in the first place. And then um, Professor Abramson recommended that I, quote unquote, you know, kind of fight fire with fire. And, and if I was going to look into um, anti-Zionism to not only see why they think what they think, but also to um, importantly rebut um, what they have to say with um, their own rebuttals. And so that, that was an interesting procedure because I personally am not particularly religious. And so um, it was interesting taking that different perspective. Well, I'm so glad you asked this question because my research in particular was inspired by 
my grandma's firsthand experience of being a labor Zionist in the 1930s and 40s. She didn't make Aliyah, but she was on training farms in the United States. And as I was interviewing her for a different project, she told me one story that really stuck with me, wherein her and one of her friends were the only two girls sent to the training farm in upstate New York to cook for all the boys while the boys learned stick fighting and prepared to go off and win a state for the Jews in the land of Palestine. So that anecdote really stuck with me. And when it came time to propose my research project, I wanted to do something that connected with my family's experience. My grandmother and my mother are, you know, both followed this path. And so I thought it was good to have this family connection and you know, all the resources I was able to get from either members of my family or friends of my parents. So it was a unique experience in finding that. Yeah, for me, this is a really intriguing question that has a lot to do with my political opinions, just like on the university, because, you know, I'm from Kansas. I'm also not necessarily religious and and I'm also studying art history, which is seems very you know, peculiar why I am, you know, presenting at this conference, but, you know, and so to be completely honest, I was involved in this research project through um, the University of Kansas's Center for Undergraduate Research, you know, where there was a posting, and then I followed up on it, um, and that's how I met uh, Dr. Rami Zidane, and um, we um, just the process evolved from there, and, you know, I have a lot of reservations about, um, you know, how the ways in which anthropology can objectify populations, turn them into statistics and mere documents, right? Um, and how the university has a certain extractive relationship to those populations. Um, but at the same time, you know, so if it's true that I'm involved in this research through not necessarily, a, you know, like Jonah's story, for instance, like an organic sense of interest or, or relationality, you know, how, how, what does it mean, you know, then to get involved in these kinds of researches? Um, I think that, I think that it has, you know, obvious um, um, reservations, like I said earlier, because of, you know, the extractive nature of that research might pose and the objectification that research might do. But I also think it has, there is also, I think, like a, a pockets for resistances in which we can increase visibility of those who are on the margins. And we can also, you know, think about our research in ways that allows us to kind of deconstruct hegemonic concepts that are within like Western feminisms, for example, that might universalize this notion, you know, which is really prevalent in the literature of public and private. Oh, and throughout the literature, there was a, um, a very like stringent emphasis on the nature of Drew society was one in which the public and private were intertwined. And so the notion that women should just be inserted into the public sphere would be one that is not necessarily attuned to the particularities of Drew society. So I think in this instances, there is a lot of the notion of interest is one that is very unique for me, but I think it can also um, allow us or that question poses a lot of questions that are about the politics of the university, what happens in anthropology, and how can we resist, you know, these kinds of technologies of extraction, et cetera. Um, so yeah, no, I think it was a great question. Um, and yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah, so um, for me, um, my, my research uh, in general, I like to think of it as uh, nationalism in society and then also uh, how uh, American Zionist nonprofits uh, affect uh, student movements on campus. Um, but as someone who's been very Israel critical and vocally Israel critical uh, throughout my college experience, um, I was very interested in concepts of secular Jewish anti-Zionism and the motif maybe of the self-hating Jew. And I think that's what initially led me to Hannah Arendt and uh, to her work on Zionism. Molly, did you want to answer how you got onto the topic of Indian Jews in Israel? Yes, I want to answer. So the foremost reason for why I choose Indian Jewish diaspora in Israel as my topic was that diaspora play a, an important role establishing between two countries. And secondly, India and Israel did not have full diplomatic ties until 1992. India didn't recognize Israel as a member, as a country in UN resolution. So after establishing full diplomatic relations, India and Israel have moved really very fast in their relations in terms of defense, 
in terms of defense in terms of their economy in terms of their student sharing programs and in everything so this was the reason why i chose and another reason was that i found this topic very interest, interesting about discovering how indian jews or have made a long way to reach israel and what role they have played since then Great. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, just use the raise hand function or you can type it out in the chat. I don't see anything typed, so I'll wait for the next person to raise their hand and I can call on you. Mili? Yeah, so thank you all for intriguing presentations. I learned a lot from this panel. Um, I would like to ask uh, Jonah about um, women in the Zionist labor movement. Uh, the primary text that you used, um, I never saw anything a bit more ancient. Uh, 10, 20 years before that, we have uh, Rachel, and we have the whole issue of uh, Chavat Alamot, the ladies' farm, which tried to uh, bring women into uh, you know, Zionist labor and work the land, and they wrote a lot. I was wondering if you refer to this text and if these texts had any influence on the other primary texts that you quote, and also maybe directly on your grandmother. I'd be interested to hear that also. Thank you for the question. So my the best trove of primary sources I had access to had been published in The Plow Woman, which was a anthology of texts by uh, Rachel Katzmerelson, who had essentially put out a call in the early 1930s to women who had made Aliyah and asked them to send in written accounts of their experiences of making Aliyah. And then Rachel Ben Nazi, who was writing sort of, I guess, half a generation earlier during World War I, especially calling for the you know, women in the Zionist movement to be allowed to support the war effort in particular for you know, winning Palestine for the British at the time. So I think she was the earliest writer I looked at. I did read you know, a few sort of secondary sources of biographies of women who came over a generation earlier, sort of, um, and, uh, but I found sort of their socioeconomic profile was a little more like middle-class sort of coming through Hadassah rather than through labor Zionist channels. So in that way, I guess one place my research and paper could expand is looking at those writers who were writing in the teens as opposed to the 20s and 30s. Definitely, because I'm sure there's a direct impact. Thank you. You're on. Thank you. Uh, I have a question um, for Eddie. Um, I really appreciate you raising the contradictions or inconsistencies in Hannah Arendt's um, thought about Zionism and the current situation in Israel is in itself full of contradictions uh, just in the past few weeks. So my question is, how? what are your thoughts, if you have any thoughts on what we can take from Hannah Arendt's perspective on what we have seen in Israel, both in security, so society, political aspects um, in Israel. Yeah, that, that is something I've been thinking about a lot, especially in the last few weeks. And I really wanted to include a little bit, uh, something more relevant to the contemporary moment, given all that's happened, uh, you know, just four weeks ago. Um, but I will say that I think what Arendt uh, really touches on, I think that impacted me, was this idea that, um, you know, uh, it, it's hard to develop a thriving polity uh, in Israel, given such a need for defense and defense interests. And that uh, before anyone else in 1948, uh, Arendt was identifying that, uh, you know, the military and the industry around military um, would sort of uh, submerge many of what she thought the value of the Jewish state would be in terms of, uh, you know, revolutionizing Jewish politics. Uh, she was very uh, affirmative about a belief that Jewish politics needed to exist and exist in a form that would um, be, that would guarantee uh, a home for Jewish people 
that would allow for a, a thriving Jewish culture. And I think, I, I, I don't know if I can answer this succinctly, and there's, I think, a lot that she would have to say about what is going on right now. But I think, ultimately, uh, what, what Arendt really hits on, I think, very brilliantly is, is sort of the ideological will of Jews and Arabs not to perceive each other and the ideological will to believe in this maxim of a land without a people for a people without a land. Um, whereas I think, uh, and I think a lot of that is carried to now, you know, just uh, simply put. So uh, it, it's hard to, to say exactly, but I think so many of her predictions uh, were very prescient, uh, especially at the time in terms of how the state would develop. Thank you. Well, I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see if Israel will go through the process that Aaron has went through um, in terms of change in perspective. Thank you. So a very apt uh, deduction of Arendt, although we could say that she does have a weak spot in her critiques of Jews and Arabs not perceiving each other. Arendt is very much a top-down philosopher. She looks at the structure from the state and then the people are the ants below the state. In a lot of her 1940s writing, she says that she says that there aren't thinkers who are looking for linkages between Jews and Arabs, but there were, and they were usually post-Ottoman Sephardim that she had never engaged with, whose names that she didn't know. These are also philosophers who are writing in Hebrew and in Arabic. So there's all sorts of interesting further critiques to level at her end. Yeah. More and just to like, touch on that briefly, there's many critiques you could level at Arendt. Arendt was incredibly Eurocentric. Uh, in, in so many ways. And so much of her thinking on Zionism was that it had to solve other problems for people in Europe, not just problems within the Mediterranean or the Levant. And also beyond that, uh, she very much didn't visit Israel. From her trip in 1935 until 1960, when she went for the Eichmann trial, she didn't go to Israel once. And she had very little knowledge of what was going on there. She hadn't spoken to anyone uh, from what I've researched. And uh, I think there are many critiques you could level about Arendt, she shoots from the hip, um, but ultimately a very uh, influential and in many ways correct political thinker. So, also, All right, also where, where she came from and, and also uh, the fact that she was a student of Heidegger and then, you know, the turn of Heidegger and what she had to escape. So we can see where it's coming, it's coming from, the shooting from the hip. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we have two minutes. And so if there's an additional question, we can probably sneak one in. Now one minute. <laughs> I have a question unless you want to do closing remarks. So it's oh, no, ask the question and then uh, we can wrap up and we'll head to our, our break. Okay, great. Thank you. So I have a question for Aviv about uh, the ultra-Orthodox and their uh, resentment of Zionism. I was wondering if your theory uh, resonates, do you think, in the, you know, the political sphere of Orthodox in Israel today, you know, the very sad catastrophe that happened in Mount Meron only, you know, a few weeks ago and you know, the sphere of Orthodox life in Israel as it is right now, do you think that your theory reaches uh, these uh, realms? Mm, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a good question. Um, how, how do you mean exactly, like, uh, in, in what respect? And, and how do you, how are you bringing in the, the tragedy at um, Mount Ramon? So the fact that the ultra-Orthodox resent Zionism and then they are a pocket within Israeli society you know, they don't, don't get everything equally, but then they don't want to get everything equally. They have their own separate education and separate, you know, places and they, they separate themselves and then a catastrophe happens. So we have to see, you know, how the balance of the theory of their against Zionism comes to reality in their day-to-day -day life in Israel today. So I was wondering if you can, you know, if your um, paper encompasses this uh, fin um, fine balance. Got it. Yeah, <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. And, and you're right that there is a, a lot of conflict over there, and I know that there's a, it's a, there's a pretty pre prevalent animosity between secular and ultra orthodox um, in Israel, and and I think that that kind of tension that you touched on was a, a big reason why um, non Zionists are kind of the majority within the ultra orthodox movement because they they realize that they need somewhere to go, they don't particularly like how secular Israel is in most respects. But they also um, realize that all things considered, they live pretty well in Israel with um, pretty hefty subsidies. Um, and so what has also, and I think that this is what you were touching on a bit, what has also interested me is that um, <clears throat> the, the vocal anti-Zionists within Israel, um, I always wondered, well, 
why do they even live in Israel if they're so adamantly against the state of Israel? Um, and I and I think the answer is kind of a simple one, which is really they don't have, you know, really any anywhere else to go. There, there is um, a, a vocal ultra orthodox anti Zionist movement in New York. Um, <clears throat> And, and it's and also I'm sure a holy most, land, yeah. right? I mean, they live there because Abraham lived there. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that there is that, um, there is a dichotomy. It's an interesting one. Um, and it's always interesting how it applies to the present day as well when you, when you see tragedies. I mean, they, it, it's that particular tragedy is interesting because in a way they subvert, um, the, the orders from the central government and, and do whatever they want. But when something goes wrong, they're reliant on the central government to, to help them. Um, so I, I think it'll, I think it'll be a conflict that'll continue. For quite yeah. Hopefully time. now with the new government, this, these issues will be more um, under control. This is the, at least the promise we get from the new government. So let's hope. Yeah. All right, and with that, I think we're gonna wrap up our panel. Please give a big hand to all of our presenters. Give a big hand to yourselves. You all did so great. And uh, we will be taking a lunch break now. so a little bit longer than the break that was between the previous panels. And we will reconvene for the third and final session at 12.30 PM Pacific Standard Time, whatever that is for you in your time zone. And I very much look forward to seeing you all then. Great work again. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.